Welcome ladies and gentlemen, my name is Rob Knox. Have you ever taken one of those online tests that purportedly offer you insights into an aspect of you, such as your sociability or your chances of future financial success or even your potential life expectancy? Perhaps you've taken a psychometric assessment or test, and I'll use those words interchangeably, in the process of applying for jobs. How much weight and credence should we give to such assessments and are such assessments consequential? Well, the answer is, it depends. Over the next 10 to 10 minutes or so, I'd like to explore with you the world of psychometric assessments insofar as they're used in the workplace for identifying and developing leaders and for selecting desirable leadership attributes. It will become apparent shortly, but threaded through this exploration, I'd also like to consider one particular question. Are such assessments fit for purpose in a world where organisations are placing increasing emphasis on diversity and inclusion, not only for potential altruistic value, but also for competitive advantage? So what do organisations even care about and how do we know? Well, there is something of an obsession by research-based institutions, and those include educational institutions, government agencies, not-for-profit uh, organisations and for-profit organisations, to regularly gather information from large corporates, this is the big end of town, in an effort to analyse and, anal and understand trends and to develop insights. Perhaps a, a good place to, to gather this information is from supervisory boards in the, in the executive teams given their knowledge of and their visibility across the organisations they lead. So it turns out there are a number of emerging trends revealed in recent such surveys, amongst which diversity and inclusion, or similar themes, is consistently referred to as being amongst the top organisational priorities. I've listed three examples. Uh, a study by Harvard Law School recently identified diversity and inclusion as priority number two amongst the organisations it polled. And in a similar vein, EY or Ernst & Young uh, found uh, within its uh, survey or its research that diversity and inclusion was priority number five for, uh, for the organisations uh, selected. In a similar but slightly different vein, McKinsey and Company in a report uh, uh, said that between 2008 and 2010, companies with more diverse top teams were also top financial performers. So, what is diversity and inclusion? Well, it encompasses attributes including gender, age, ethnicity, religious beliefs and sexual identity. Well, what does this mean for leadership? There is a logic that suggests organisational priorities translate directly to senior leadership priorities, including the priorities of those sitting on supervisory boards, as well as those on executive teams. And I quite like this quote from Robert Hogan. Organisations need leaders to make key decisions, anticipate and manage uh, sorry, anticipate and manage changing market trends and set strategic vision. And while not part of that quote, I would also like to add, if supervisory boards have identified diversity and inclusion as a priority, among other priorities, such as uh, those relating to technological change, cyber security and so on, it stands to reason that leaders of these same organisations need to be appropriately equipped to bring about the improvements that are uh, being required. So how do organisations ensure they have the right individuals and teams in place to deliver on such a priority? How, how might this be achieved? Let's turn our attention to psychometric testing. So while psychometric testing, that is assessing the attributes uh, such as knowledge, skills and personality, is a relatively recent human pursuit, it does have its origins dating back 2000 years to ancient China and specifically in regard to the selection processes for the Chinese civil service. Notwithstanding these ancient origins, according to Kaplan, Hurt and Kutz in 1967, scientific approaches to psychometric testing actually dates to the latter part of the 19th century, 
It can be traced to individuals such as Galton and Binet, uh, from which new plays emerged in the earlier part of the 20th century, including Yerkes, Woodworth, Rorschach and Cattell. If we then narrow our focus to psychometric testing in the workplace, well, there's a plethora of tests available in the marketplace, some of which are psychometrically sound, if I can use that expression, while others have not been subjected to sufficient scientific uh, scrutiny to support any claim they actually measure what they purportedly set out to measure. I've listed three examples. The Hogan assessments, of which there are various types, Clifton strengths, and the Savile consulting wave styles. But ideally, these tests are not used in isolation when making decisions about others' careers. They should be complemented by other strategies, including multi-source feedback or 360-degree feedback, as well as other strategies such as interviews. That said, organisations may not actually have the expertise to even help them decide the validity or otherwise of a psychometric test they're considering or evaluating for, say, leadership purposes, and hence may make a poor decision. And this is consistent with the findings of Cicchetti in 1994. Organisations may in fact fall prey to pseudoscientific psychometric tests, if such an oxymoron exists, that lack the necessary robustness to support confidence in making workforce decisions such as those uh, determining who will be selected for leadership, op leadership opportunities, who might be included or excluded from a leadership program, who might be in the frame for a promotion into a leader leadership position in a, uh, in, a, in a more immediate sense. Much of the research and thinking which involves the validation of psychometric tests actually dates back to the mid-1950s and uh, we can link it back to a, a fairly uh, landmark paper by Cronbach and Meal in 1955. And listed here are some important considerations um, when evaluating the relative technical, uh, particularly around construct validity, and practical benefits of selecting one psychometric uh, strategy over another. Things like standardisation procedures, norming procedures, test reliability, test validity. These are the technical aspects. And when uh, we look at those in association with some of the practical uh, considerations, such as the cost of the test, the associated time investment, as well as the instructiveness of the insights and the reporting being provided, we realise there are a number of things that need to be taken into account when selecting an appropriate psychometric test. As an important side note, um, constructing, sorry, establishing construct validity, for example, might involve doing so against the norms of other well-established constructs, such as the big five personalities traits or the great eight competencies, as popularised by Savile Holsworth. The, the, the process of validating a psychometric test is intentionally deliberate and it takes time and it takes effort. And that, to some extent, brings me to this slide. What has Darwin got to do with it? Well, in brief, as I've said, test validation requires time and effort. Speaking from personal experience, I have, as a, a candidate, used the Hogan assessment and also used the consulting wave style assessment and conflicts dynam dynamic profile assessment as an HR practitioner. The reports generated in these assessments as a result of an ind individual undertaking uh, one of these highly evolved psychometric tests are often detailed, but they're also very insightful. They, in all likely, however, are very relevant in regard to assessing uh, those leadership attributes that we might think, of, of, sort of think about as being stable and enduring. Yet the question in my mind is this, might there be some hidden talent more suited to contemporary and future leadership requirements that remain hidden because of the high value we place on the existing assessments and our um, perhaps our biases uh, towards wanting to use these particular assessments? And so that brings me to the last slide. The points out, outlined here may well form the basis of future research and act as a construct for decision makers to pause and ask their own question, what is it that we want of our leaders and how will we select for this desirable outcome? 
So in summary, I think we've established that supervisory boards place importance on effective leadership. And in fact, that's probably a given. Um, we've come to a view that, um, that the supervisory boards and those leading organisations are increasingly recognising that diversity and inclusion as being associated with desirable organisation wellbeing and performance outcomes. So this is an emerging trend, one that's, uh, I suppose, continually being reinforced and established through some of the um, surveying that's done by uh, research firms and research organisations. Organisations themselves use psychometric testing as one means of assessing and selecting potential leaders. Uh, however, uh, as I pointed out in the last slide, um, many of these psychometric tests have been in the market for a long time, in some cases decades. And the question is, um, do they adequately test for future leaders? Which just I guess is reinforced by that last bullet point, have commonly applied psychometric, uh, psychometric tests sufficiently adapted to help select for leadership styles that will in fact enhance diversity and inclusion outcomes into the future. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you very much.